Thank you. Yeah, I have to say it's uh, quite a thing to follow the uh, editor in chief of UK Wired magazine, but I will do my best to offer something as interesting as David. Um, so today I'm going to talk about designing for the extreme. Um, we've just heard about a lot of kind of big ideas, I think, and I'm going to sort of look on a more kind of micro level, a kind of uh, one designer designing for one person in an extreme situation and the things that I learned doing that. So yeah, this is me. Um, I am a senior design strategist and experienced designer at Smart Design. Smart Design are a human-centered uh, design consultancy. We're about almost 40 years old. Um, we've got offices in New York and in London. I'm based in the London office. But essentially, we offer services to a range of clients uh, across healthcare and finance and mobility. Um, but it's always about putting the person at the center of the design process. And it's the thing that I've always been really, really passionate about as a designer is how to uh, understand the needs of, of a person and um, you know, use that to inform the design. Um, just out of interest, has anyone heard of Smart Design? Nope. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that we had more uh, people knowing who on were than smart. But um, so uh, this is probably my favorite case study of smart. I'm just going to give you um, just this one so you know who we are. Um, it's the design of um, the OXO Good Grips potato peeler. And the story behind it is really, really nice. So our uh, CEO and founder was um, having dinner with um, a friend and the wife of this friend was really struggling to use a really basic household item, a potato peeler. And uh, David sort of looked at this and he thought, this is ridiculous, how is it that such a basic um, tool is so poorly used? The woman had um, extreme arthritis in her hands um, and you know, this you know, household tool was just failing her. So what he did is he went off and made a study of both people with arthritis, so the sort of um, ergonomic challenges that they would have, um, and sort of worked out what the criteria was for those, um, for those kind of people. But at the same time, he also looked at high-end professional chefs that are working in, you know, like a really busy, fast-paced um, kitchen. And what he discovered is that when you define the criteria for both those ends of the spectrum, you actually end up being able to design a product for everyone in between. And OXO Good Grips is a very well-known um, well brand um, that has sort of expanded into lots and lots of different products by taking this kind of process of designing for both ends of the extreme. So today, um, I want to give you a sort of an evolution of this process. Um, so rather than designing for two ends of the spectrum, recently I had an experience where I was designing for just one end of the spectrum, the arthritis, the person who's in an extremely difficult situation. And it turned out to be really interesting. Um, this is kind of my hypothesis, and I'd be very interested to see what you guys think about it. But my feeling is, if you design for the, for the extreme, you, are better, you design better experiences for everyone. So by going really deep and really with, in that circumstance, you design better experiences. But we'll see at the end whether you think that's true or not. Um, I think this is down to two core reasons. Um, the first is that designing for the extreme um, creates one extreme person creates a deeper sense of empathy between the designer and the person they're designing for. Um, you know, in, at SMART, we are, we are always trying to understand people, but you can only get a certain level of empathy when you're designing for a whole market of people. Um, and something quite different happens when you're doing something for someone that you really, really get to know. Um, and the other thing is that designing for one extreme has a lot of constraints because you've got one person, you're not sort of that has certain characteristics, and I believe that fosters greater creativity. So the two um, stories I'm going to tell you to kind of illustrate this um, were actually from a um, program that I was involved in called Big Life Fix. Anyone seen Big Life Fix? Ah, okay, two people. Um, so Big Life Fix was a BBC Two documentary. The second series hasn't actually come out yet, so you're lucky, you can, <laughs> you can still tune in. 
Um, but the first series came out in uh, 2016. Um, and it was a really interesting program because it essentially took a team of designers, of which I was one, and it was a really varied group. We had um, human-centered designers like me, we had coders, we had material scientists, different kinds of engineers that were then given the challenge of designing for just one person um, in an extreme case across the UK. Most of the cases were... Um, were people living with disability because it's often those circumstances that are the most difficult and this is where we thought the most impact would come. So I'm gonna talk you, I'm gonna talk you to, through to, uh, two stories. Uh, the first is Graham. So this is Graham. Uh, he is now about 60 years old, but a couple of years ago he suffered a really severe stroke. Uh, what happened when he came to is that he'd survived it, but he was living with uh, partial locked-in syndrome. Um, locked-in syndrome is a condition that means you are totally paralyzed, um, unable to speak or move. In his case, he was able to move a little bit, one of his hands, but that was it. And it would especially be determined on how tired he was. So the more tired he'd get, the less he would be able to do but speaking was completely out of the question. And actually, for a long time, they didn't even realize what was going on. It takes a while for, for the medical professionals to figure this out. So it's an incredibly, incredibly difficult circumstance to find yourself in. I mean, you've survived, but you know, you're know you essentially kind of not there anymore because people would sort of, um, when you're not able to communicate, when you're not able to speak to someone, you, you're kind of ignored. So when we met him, he was um, able to communicate um, painstakingly by, with the tiny bit of movement that he did have in his uh, left hand um, by typing things out with a stylus on an iPad. But this was huge, huge effort for him, and it would take him many, many minutes to write even just one word, one um, sentence. So most of the time, you know, by the time he'd actually finished writing the sentence that he wanted to say, the, the moment had passed, you know? So it completely destroys any kind of communication that you would have with the people around you. Um, I think that one of the things that really struck me about this whole process was I spent many, many hours with both Graham and his wife, Zoe, and the, the relationship that I built with them and the bond that I created with them with them really influenced the way that I designed. And this is what I was talking about with this deep sense of empathy. I, one thing that really stuck with me was um, Zoe really early on had said, she sort of almost you know, really asked me to go home and take recordings of my loved ones. She said, you have no idea what it feels like to have that taken away from you, to not actually ever hear your loved one's voice ever again. And she was so, it, it had affected her so much, she wanted me to go home and do something just in case I was ever left in the same situation as her. And I can't really describe how that really stayed with me. You know, this, this whole situation, Zoe and Graham and the, and the problems they were facing was, I mean, it's kind of all I was thinking about. And every time I was with a, a, you know, a family friend or my boyfriend, I'd be thinking, what if I never could, communicate with you again? How would that feel? Um, it's very common within the design industry to try and uh, co-create and try and work with the person you're designing for to, um, to, to, you know, to create something. With Graham, that was very difficult because the communication was the problem, um, but we did find ways of, of going about it. So what you see here is one of the early things that we did where we kind of started to imagine the different things that he might want the final solution to do, and then asked him to prioritize. So you can see on the left there, at the top it says must have, nice to have, and lower priority. And the, the sort of post-its are saying things like, I wanna be able to communicate as fast as possible, or I want to be able to communicate uh, with as much articulation or as much depth of, you know, as, or as many words as possible. And so he was actually able to kind of dictate to us what he wanted the, um, what he wanted the solution to do, which was really, really helpful. One of the other things um, that I 
did to try and deepen that empathy and deepen that understanding was to just sort of be around friends and family without speaking to see what it really felt like. So actually spending several hours not saying anything at all to see, to see what that really felt like. And I think one of the things that was really interesting that I discovered was that communication between people doesn't necessarily have to be that a sort of long articulated sentence. A lot of the time it can be just a kind of a nod or an, an acknowledgement that the other person has heard and understood you. And you can actually go quite a long way by, by doing that. Um, so it started to kind of, it, it started to transpire that what we really needed to do was help him be able to amplify the things that he was feeling or the, the reactions that he was having to what was going on around him. Um, this is a... <laughs> This is a post-it note. I love post-it notes, by the way. That's just how I spend all my time. Um, this is where I was trying to map all of human emotion, <laughs> which is really difficult, um, to try and start thinking, right, if you need to be able to react in any possible way, how do you do it? So um, at the top, you've got positive emotions. At the bottom, it was negative. At the left-hand side, it's playful. And on the other side, it was kind of serious. And actually, that made sort of that axis was quite a good way of mapping the key kind of reactions that you might have to something. Um, it was kind of throughout all of this and spending all the time with Graham that I realized that really the essence of what this, you know, sort of design was about was giving Graham presence back in the room. You know, rather than having... He was in a situation where, you know, doctors would be talking over the top of him and talking to Zoe instead of him. Because when, when a human doesn't get any feedback at all, you, you assume that there's nothing going on. And that wasn't the case at all. It was the opposite. He was very able to hear and see everything that was going on and just not able to react. So that was kind of what really honed in and became the challenge. So um, again, with a few more kind of co-creation rounds with Graham, starting to sort of pinpoint the things that he wanted to be able to react with, we created this. So this is an app um, that essentially behind each of these tiles is a recording, is, a, is a, uh, an audio of the information on the tile. And it, will, it was controlled by a, a, by a joystick. Um, so using the little bit of movement that he had, he's able to um, move across the grid and down to select the, the one that he wanted to do. So we broke it down into attention, sort of really serious things, um, quick statements, so uh, things like, um, you know, who, what, where, why, good morning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you will also see on the attention one, there's an ahem um, uh, uh, button, which is about sort of getting attention. And then there's the emotion. So this was kind of the um, taking what we had done on, on that earlier grid and putting it into the app so that he could sort of on one, one side be delighted and the other side um, be sort of express depression. We also, as it happened, wanted to give him a bit of control of some of the environment as a sort of additional um, feature. Um, one of the reasons that we designed it as a grid was that over time you're able to sort of memorize that sort of one, one, down, down, sort of, you know, kind of like right, right, down, down, would always get to the same place. So you can have almost shortcuts to be able to get to places. And over time, he would get really quick at it. Um, this is my, one of the other designers on the show designing the, um, the joystick. Um, I mentioned already that one of Graham's problems was his ability when he was tired versus when he um, was full of energy was quite different. So the black line there is what he felt that he could, the movement he could do on a good day and the red is on a bad day. Um, but through many iterations and crude prototypes, we were able to design this, which is um, a joystick that would allow him to, to control the app. Now, I haven't mentioned anything so far about the what the audio actually was. And there was a very important thing to mention about Graham, which was that he'd really said right from the start that he didn't want the Stephen Hawkins uh, voice. Like, he really didn't like that robotic voice because Essentially, when you've lost your voice, why would you want it to be replaced with a robot? Um, and I think this is 
where the, the constraints of the situation sort of prompted greater creativity because um, what actually ended up happening is we were inspired by um, the Transformers movie. <laughs> I have to admit that I've seen it. Um, it's not a great film, but uh, it does have one um, element in it which I think is really lovely, which is the robot alien is um, the way that it communicates, because it doesn't have a voice, is it jumps between radio stations. So it makes sentences based on things that it's hearing on the radio, which is really lovely. So what we did with Graham is all those emotion tabs we basically used or sort of borrowed uh, clips from TV and film so that all the audio files themselves had the expression that they needed um, in the uh, sort of recorded already in, in, the, in the file. Um, so, for example, I think Delighted was the, the moment in It's a Wonderful Life where he's running down the street shouting yippee because there's, there's a robot voice would never be able to do that, but the emotion and the kind of the drama in it... Um, is really powerful. Um, actually, when we, were when we were telling Graham about this aspect of the design, um, we hadn't mentioned the Transformers movie at thing at all, but the, the only thing that he typed out on his iPad was Bumblebee, and he'd made the exact same reference, which is the name of the robot alien. So he got it. Um, as is always totally crazy in these situations, about three weeks before we were about to deliver the product, um, something really extraordinary happened, which was, um, whereas Zoe had said right at the beginning that she just you know, really wished that she could hear his voice again, and we had said, do you not have any phone recordings, any you know, videotapes, but she said nothing, and she'd looked and asked everyone, and there just wasn't anything. They were having work done on their house, um, actually, to better um, cater for Graham. And um, an old box of videotapes was found in the attic. And we were able to go through and go through. The, the, the good thing about working with the BBC is you have very powerful editing rooms. So they went through all the footage and pulled out every single time he said anything. And we were able to populate um, a lot of the other audio files in the in the app with Graham's own voice. Um, I do have a video here. And this is Graham using the app for the first time. When Graham lost his voice, I said to all my friends and family, get a recording of your husband or boyfriend, because my God, did I miss that, that good night. I love you. That was horrendous, not having his boys. thing for Graham at the moment is that people are treating him like he's brain dead when he's not. The key thing is that he can say just a quick statement whenever the urge comes across. Yourself, just like at home. But we did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You're not supposed to throw stones at the video camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be great again. That is a strong look. Dad, say something. I'm knackered. With a quick flash. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it's naughty. It is so naughty. Yay! And he's really nice looking at these lovebirds. Uh. It's 
it's just amazing to actually see what he's really like. Or what he used to be like. Yeah, he's but still he's, still, he's, like, he's just it? still there. Just he can't get out. Yeah. Uh, quarter to one, and I think I've written the code. I definitely felt a very, very strong emotional connection to this story. You could be like your dad or your brother or anyone. We found clips of you and your own voice from the home videos that we've dug out the attic so that they're actually you. We went through about 50 hours of footage. <laughs> it was really nice for us, actually, to hear you speak and see you move, and that was really great. All right, Graham, over to you, I guess. I'm going to do, sorry. <laughs> Oh, what are you getting present here? <laughs> oh, really? yeah. I don't care what you say. Have a well-earned rest <laughs> and a drink. <laughs> Thank you, guys. See you tomorrow? Yeah. I love you, Zoe. <laughs> See you tomorrow? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of clip shows it all. It was a really, really extraordinary thing to be a part of, and um, certainly the the emotional engagement that I had with that story was so high right from the start. Because when you're when you're just designing for one person and you're spending all that time with them, you you know you are, you're able to really kind of live what they're living. And I think that there's something really special in that that is, is sort of worth thinking about when, you, when you're designing other things. Um, so I think I'm okay for time. Um, I have um, a second story to tell you about. Uh, this was um, a more recent, it was actually the last um, episode that aired, uh, which was a Children in Need special. Um, and this was another uh, really amazing story, but I think what's kind of interesting, I've now done five of these projects, and you know, this kind of theory of designing for the extreme has, you know, it's definitely got a lot of legs to it. So uh, this is Josh. Uh, Josh is eight, uh, he lives in Blackheath, and um, he has got something called Nori disease. Uh, Nori disease means that you are, it doesn't in all cases, but in his case, um, he is profoundly blind, so, that means he hasn't got any light perception at all, and he was like that from birth. Um, he goes to a mainstream school, meaning that he's the only blind child in the school, um, local to where his family are. And um, it's the sort of, the challenge in this case was, you know, I mean, there's, there's many to choose from, but the thing that they had identified as being a really significant problem was that he was getting on pretty well in classes, but he was really, really missing out when it came to being in the playground with his friends. Um, as you can probably imagine, um, you know, they, they, one of the things they did was actually blindfold me and push me into the playground. And it's really intimidating because not only have you got, um, you know, uneven ground, you've got m children screaming, like things moving around you. Of course, you wouldn't want to willingly uh, put yourself into that situation. So what was happening was Josh was spending all his classroom, all his break times um, alone, um, playing with um, his favorite toy, which was Spotify, um, making, making playlists. Um, so I was working um, with, a, uh, with one of the other designers, Jude, in this case, and we kind of set about on this challenge. How can we get Josh playing in the playground confidently when he's the only child that can't see? Um, we, uh, we actually did quite a bit of uh, 
research and spoke to some other um, other people with Norrie disease, other people that were blind, older adults that were blind, to see what kind of impact this might have um, sort of later in life. And it was quite a, it was quite a, um, an awakening to really understand what it's like to live today in, um, without being able to see. Uh, one of the things that really stood out to me was one, one guy we interviewed said, um, people don't talk to me, I have to talk to them. And I mean, a little bit similarly to Graham, you know, when, you, when you're talking to Josh, um, for a start, he always puts his head down because he doesn't need to look at you because he's listening. But when you're another person trying to communicate with him, it's actually really difficult because it's a totally unnatural way of speaking. So it's, it's difficult, especially for children, to, to be able to communicate. But, you know, when you think about the... The, the friendships and the development that happen in the playground, it's so, it's so critical um, that, you know, these, the adults were, were saying that actually keeping friends and keeping social as a blind person is really, really difficult. Um, so that's what we wanted to try and change. Now, we came up with lots of different ideas, um, originally all to do with navigation, kind of how do we tell him where he is in that space? Um, and we tried lots of different things because um, we have, you know, different sort of tech people helping us out. Um, and the first kind of major experiment we did was we put um, Bluetooth beacons all around the playground. And then we had uh, one of the coders on the team did a, made an app that meant as you were walking along, the app would identify when it had crossed a beacon. So it would say, you are at the swings, you are here, you are that, so that he... The theory was that we'd be able to, to navigate around the playground better and interact with the, with the children. Now, um, what's kind of interesting is that what we realized is that um, we were being too kind of um, singular in our ambition for him. It wasn't just about navigating him. It wasn't about changing Josh to be able to suit his environment. It was actually about... Um, I'll come back to that. It was actually about um, leveling the playing field. It was actually bringing the other, it's about bringing the, the other children and Josh onto the same plane so that there was no disability and they were, they were all able to play together. Um, the reason I put this slide in, this is a really fantastic product. I'm not saying it isn't, but it is an example of where I think that true human understanding that wasn't fully kind of realized, um, it's the Microsoft. Um, project, which was um, a pair of um, uh, glasses that were, were reading things around you and sort of like feeding information so that you can be walking along and it's describing what's around you. Now, that's really amazing, but it's still changing the person rather than the environment. So we kind of um, went back to the drawing board a little bit and we had to sort of really understand play as well as um, Josh's needs. So we did a bit of kind of playground safari and we're watching all the kids uh, running around. Um, we even had <laughs> two of the kids were kind of like my little kid detectives and we're like writing down everything that was happening in the playground. And what, what we realized was that play uh, needs to be really free. Um, actually, kids are really imaginative and in their playground, they had a few kind of things that they... Um, that they were supposed to interact with. And actually, the thing that they were most interested in was um, a tree stump that they were all kind of like piling on top of and jumping off and pretending it was a castle or something like that. And all of that's always changing. And we realized that we needed to create something that would give Josh and the other children this kind of even playing field, but also kept it as loose as possible so that they could invent what they were going to do. Um, so this was this was the design that we came up with. This all happened over about six months, by the way. Um, what we what we decided to use was some really fantastic existing infrastructure. Um, this is guidance paving. Um, you might see it outside on the street um, at crossings, um, at stations. Um, the one the blister tiles um, essentially in the blind community. When you feel it underfoot, it means stop. There's a hazard. There's something to be aware of and the kind of lozenger-shaped um, tiles are directional, so they mean go this way. So that's actually something that Josh is a little bit familiar with. 
Now, what we decided was in order for him to be able to um, have even more confidence, what if we gave more information to the, to the tiles? So essentially what we're doing here is we are laying down um, interactive pads underneath so that when you jump on one of the blister tiles, it makes a sound. Now, sound is something that, um, you know, both Josh and his friends can enjoy. So it can be both a navigational cue and a play tool for the other kids. This was us testing it with the uh, Gloucestershire, um, uh, a, a, a goal ball, goodness, I forgot, a goal ball team. Goal ball is a fantastic sport um, that was designed for um, World War II soldiers who'd lost their sight. And it's a, a game that uses a ball with a bell in it. And all players, sighted or not, um, wear um, uh, eye shields so that um, so they're put on an, a, an even playing field. Um, but so the design of the playground here um, is essentially a kind of road network for Josh, but the other kids, when when you're jumping on the sound, like all the kids can hear them and um, can sort of make up games based on the, the sort of sound um, kind of uh, pinpoints. Um, it was a ridiculous <laughs> feat to try and uh, build this playground. Um, unlike Graham's app, which was actually quite small scale, this was um, a whole playground full of kids. So. Uh, luckily, when you're the BBC and children in need um, and you ask for help, people help you. So we were very fortunate to have um, MACE group um, the, um, to come in and uh, help build the playground, which was amazing. Um, I'm going to show you another short video. I've got a graze all the way out my leg, which was the first day in year three. So since, I've never played with my friends out here since. I like hop, hip hop, rap, Pokemon Go, morning, shopping and Jack too. All right. So far, so good. My favourite class is playtime. My class always goes outside, but the playground's too big. It's too big? And I can't find my friends. What's this rope thing? God knows. God knows. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been thinking a lot about this guidance paving. Wouldn't it be cool if it did more than just indicate underfoot? What if it had a sound attached to it with more information? You can feel that these straight lines basically mean go in this direction. It's braille for the soles of your feet. Hey, Josh. <laughs> oh. Hey, Josh. At the beginning of every road is a sound, and at the end of every road is the same sound. Oh. <gasps> if you ever stray off one of the lines, you just find one again and you follow it until you get to a sound tile and you jump up and down and then you know exactly where you are because they're always in the same place. Exactly. This is what it was exactly. all about, yeah. yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> when he's in this space, He's just like any other kid. He's playing like his friends. He's playing with his friends. So, um, yeah, I think what was really important about this one was that, you know, when you're so heavily involved with someone, you know, it was kind of like nothing was good enough. You know, I, I mean, this was a huge amount of work by a lot of people. It was really very uh, 
it was really very intense and very difficult. But I think, you know, in other circumstances, you might have stopped at the kind of navigational cues, but we kind of felt like that wasn't achieving enough. Um, and so by kind of pushing it and really kind of trying to figure out what the real, real need was and understanding this kind of level playing field, we created something like this. And Josh actually goes into the playground four times a week now, um, which his um, parents are just um, over the moon about. So, um, yeah, back to my hypothesis of designing for the extreme results and better experiences for everyone. I mean, I think that there is, I think there is value in this process, in um, doing something slightly differently and, and designing for just one person um, in an extreme circumstance. Um, it's something that we are sort of looking to sell into some of our clients. They don't always take it that well because, you know, they freak out when it's like a sample size of eight, let alone one. <laughs> um, but I really do think that it, um, it could go somewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruby. Do we have any questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Marjane. I was wondering the app you did for Graham, you can uh, maybe expand it to other people with stroke because I had an uncle who was in a better situation but similar situation. So if you have some, I don't know, recording of a person voice, would it be possible? And Are you saying... Um is it is the app available for people, or are you saying, do I think it would be applicable to other people? Yeah. Can, you use it or, can you use it or adapt it to somebody else, and uh, you know how it could work uh, for what price, under what uh, conditions, and so on and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, you know. We've shared this story several times and the feedback we're getting is that there's all sorts of different kinds of conditions that would really benefit from it. Uh, children with autism as well, sort of different kinds of people that struggle to communicate for, for sure. Um, there are um, essences of the design for that that can be found in some other applications. We, um, that app's not actually launched. Um, all, the, all the projects on Big Life Fix um, were funded by the BBC up until the point that they were all prototypes. Some have been taken on by, um, like one has been taken on by Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, and yeah, we're always looking and interested in people that might want to take it on because it's kind of their, their taking. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, that was um, a really fantastic talk. Um, I, in terms of the process of when you, you know, you put your post notes all over the wall and you kind of, you're picking apart the various problems that people might have in their lives, how do you um, determine, you know, when you found something like a real nugget and something with real potential to, to design for? Um, what, what's the kind of that, you know, what, how do you know when you found it? Um, that's a great question. I think that it's, about when, you, when you've really got to know someone and you understand what their priorities are. And, you know, with Josh, we, you know, we could see the difference in his kind of body language from when he was sitting in the corner of the classroom on his own playing with his Spotify. Because we did a, an, a, um, a session really early on where all the kids were playing and he was just kind of sitting there. And he says he's happy and he says he's okay. But then when we were actually getting him outside doing something physical, like he just, I don't know, he just really kind of like opened out. So it's kind of instinctive, I suppose, but it's when you, you recognize those things. Um, and I think he, there was, he did something really amazing. He, he um, had got home after one um, session where he'd been outside. Um, he got his mum to put her hand on his chest and said, look, mum, look how fast my heart's beating <laughs> it was like because so it, it's um yeah I think you when you're really close to something as a hu it's just it's a human you just you're kind of like oh there it is like you you can sense it thank you I I just thought that that was amazing um I just thought it was just really blew me away um and I just wondered 
in developing all of what you what you do there, did you come up against any like blockers, particularly when you were doing the stuff for Josh in the playground? I mean, did you have to get like planning permission and all of that? Just just sort of talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the playground in particular was the hardest thing that I've ever done. And actually, the design of it was not straightforward, but you know, we kind of got to what we were trying to do. Then we managed to figure out how to make the tiles work. All of that was nothing in comparison to getting it okayed by the school, to get it okayed by the council. And um, to be honest, you know, it, it really looked like it wasn't gonna happen. Um, because it was too big a job. It was, there were too many kind of like safety issues with it being a playground and kids and all this kind of stuff. And um, I genuinely, at one point, we'd actually said um, that we're going to have to pull this from the Children in Need episode because that had, obviously, Children in Need is a set deadline. And um, we just were like, we can't, we can't do it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, I think that what it, what it really kind of came down to was, you know, everybody just really believed in it. So every time we kind of, you know, faced another person that was saying, you can't do it, which was multiple times a day. Um, oh, by the way, I was doing this all, all alongside my job. <laughs> um, it was kind of all the, t all the designers on Big Life Fix were, you know, it's a kind of extracurricular thing. So the stress is not even the word. It was just, it was so hard. Um, but essentially, people do get really united when they when they connect with that one human. And so, you know, I remember there was a point where we had like a board meeting with um, Mace, Mace Group, who were fantastic and did that whole thing for free, were absolutely fantastic. Um, we were standing in this room with them and people from the council, people from, from the school, and, you know... I basically, I would just like stood up and was like, you know, I just, I just want to thank you all for, for getting it this far. And, you know, this is something really extraordinary. Like this could really change his, this would really change his life. And, um, and they went for it, which was really brave of them as well. Yeah, I, I just think it's unfortunate. I mean, children need is, is all great. And you see all these fluffy stories and all the rest of it. What, what you don't realize and you've just highlighted it, is the things you have to go through, all the hurdles and all the uh, bureaucratic stuff and also people that don't listen and all the rest of it. You know, it must be an absolute pain. And I think it's one of the things that, you know, working as part of a TV show as a designer was very interesting um, and difficult. Um, but I think one of the things that TV does and something as powerful as the BBC and Children in Need is you just, you have leverage. People want to do it because it's TV. And that's the really magical thing is like that, that playground would never have existed if it hadn't been for the fact that it was going to be on TV. So I'm very grateful to TV for that reason. One second. <laughs> Thanks. So the tech world uses the word scale quite a lot. Is this scalable? And these beautiful projects aren't really scalable. There's you know, tens of thousands of pounds worth of investing for one person's benefit, um, but nonetheless, brilliantly useful. How do you think you can scale the value of the design work you're doing? Great question. Um, so it is one of the difficult things about Big Life Fix, and it's one of the things that we, we ha it has been criticized for is, you know, because you're right, those were seriously expensive, especially that playground. And yes, we got a lot of stuff for free, and that's all great, but how do you scale it? Now, I think that the real value comes in talking about it and inspiring other people to try and continue to use these processes in this kind of work. I don't know whether it necessarily is that we're going to build, you know, 50 more playgrounds. Maybe we won't, but in telling that story and sort of sharing the learning, then maybe we can influence other projects. That's, I think that's my hope. Having said that, at the, like the, um, one of the other very famous projects from the show was um, for a girl with Parkinson's 
She's, um, she's about my age, and um, she was a, she's a graphic designer. Has really bad tremors in her hands, and um, the design was this amazing wearable that would counter counteract the tremors. And whereas at the beginning she would try and draw, and she was drawing like this, which as obviously as a designer is a massive problem, she was then able to draw a perfectly straight line, and it was just absolutely extraordinary. Now Microsoft has picked that up because Haiyan Zhang, who was the designer on that pro story. They picked it up and they're running with it and it's in, it's in clinical trials. So yes, they're pouring a lot more money into it, but sometimes that happens, you know, like any kind of idea. Sometimes they win and sometimes they don't. All right.